Welcome and uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, we are, we're coming at you from the Treehouse Speakeasy Arcade from Sketch Development. Uh, I'm John Crewson, uh, founder at Sketch here, and I'm here to introduce James Nippert, uh, Agile coach, uh, and he's here to talk about retrospectives and uh, how to make them better, uh, how to craft retros your team can't wait to attend. Take it away, James. Right you are, John. Thank you very much. I want to go ahead and mute that. Uh, so like John said, uh, my name is James Nippert. I am a coach here from Sketch Development, and today we're going to be talking about crafting retrospectives. Uh, we're going to deep dive into what retros are, how to make them awesome, and how to get everyone really excited to go to them. Uh, first, just a little bit about myself. Uh, like I said, my name is James, and I am absolutely thrilled that you have all taken time away from your busy days to talk about retros with me. This is something that I'm incredibly passionate about and I believe is one of the predominant ways we're able to help teams realize their full potential. Since you're here, I'm guessing you're pretty excited about them too, you care about them too, and I think that's wonderful to see. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a coach, I've been a coach for about four years now, and a uh, scrum master for a while before that. My wife and I, uh, I have a beautiful wife, we live in St. Louis, and we have three dogs and two daughters who are awful, also beautiful. Uh, and one of them is three years old, and one of them is almost 10 weeks old. Uh, so if I trail off randomly or fall asleep, hopefully you'll give me a little bit of grace. Um, we're almost sleeping through the night, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, and over the years, I've gotten to work with a number of organizations across industries like healthcare, insurance, the Department of Defense, energy, and a few others. And the more that I do, uh, the more I'm learning what I love most is working directly with delivery teams of really cool people who build awesome things, and I love hopefully helping them find ways that they can be even more awesome. So that's about me. Uh, here's the stuff that my boss says I have to talk about real quick, which is what's Sketch. Uh, Sketch is a St. Louis-based services and consulting company. Uh, we offer all types of agile training as well as coaching. That's where I spend the majority of my time. Uh, and we also have some Jedi master developers uh, that constantly make me feel bad about how little I really know about things. Uh, and they do all sorts of awesome co-development for or with our clients. Uh, and they exemplify the values and principles that we believe in uh, by practicing them, by, by putting them into practice and building awesome stuff really, really fast. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, first, we're going to do a little bit of a reset on retrospectives, make sure we're all speaking in the same language. Uh, we're going to talk about the intents behind crafting retros, and I'm going to help you build your toolkit to make sure that you're able to build the retro that your team needs. Uh, we're going to make sure that we know how our retros are working and what to do if they're not working. Uh, stay tuned because we also have some of our favorite, most awesomest uh, retro picks that the sketch coaches here love to use. Uh, and then we're going to be doing a question and answer section at the end, depending how fast or how slow I talk. So if you want to participate in that, you can join us at Slido. Uh, I'm going to leave this up on screen for a second. You can scan the QR code and do it on your phone. You can uh, join it on your computer and drop in questions throughout the entire presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I can't hear you right now. So we're going to be dependent on you putting the questions in there. Then we'll get to them at the end. Uh, and we'll also have this in the footer on the slides in, in case you lose this or, or don't want to join in yet. Uh, and then you can vote on whatever questions have already been asked if that's something that you're also interested in. All right, so let's get into it. What is a retrospective? Well, it's an opportunity for continuous improvement. It's, in my opinion, the most important ceremony for a team's long-term success, for their long-term sustained improvement. Uh, it's also an investment in the team. And it's how teams go from good to great. It's how we move from collections of individuals who just sit near each other virtually or physically into real life teams all committed to the same goals. But it's also a break from delivery. It's costly, right? These are these are expensive hours that we are de we're deciding we're not going to do our actual jobs. Uh, and it's exclusive. Not everyone gets to go to it, right? And that 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 sucks sometimes if you don't get to go to something, there might be some FOMO on it. So if all those things are true, it had better be a good use of time and achieve its purpose. But what is its purpose? The actual purpose of a retro, a lot of times people have a misconception here. Uh, a lot of times people believe that they have to focus on the last sprint 
or the end of a project or something like that. And it's got to be a postmortem. Uh, and we talk about what went well and what didn't go well and what are we going to do different next time. However, all scrum events, the retro notwithstanding, have a real purpose. And if you do it right, everyone should be really glad they went to it. Uh, if that doesn't sound true, maybe it's time to retro your retros and figure out what the actual purpose is. I believe the actual purpose is continuous improvement towards ever higher, grander, more incredible performance. And we do that with experiments. That's the output of each retro. We should have experiments where we have a thing that if we think we change it, it's going to move us in the direction that we want to. And we'll be able to measure that experiment at the next retro and see if we actually are uh, moving in the right direction or not. And we just continue that churn forever and ever and ever and just keep getting more and more awesome. So who is the retro for? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's not for the leader. It's not for the manager. It's not for the boss. It's not for the scrum master. It's not really even for the product owner. It is there for the team. And this is where I'm, I'm talking to facilitators a lot today. This is the difference between running a meeting and facilitating one. If you're in a meeting and you're the only one talking and telling people what to do, you're running that meeting. You're not facilitating it. The idea here is to create a space for the team to have a conversation. And that is what you as the facilitator need to set up the retro in order to facilitate, is to find the right conversation and get the team talking about it. Uh, what's the trap that most retros fall into? This, is, this was my first experience with retros uh, for at least a year, probably, where, where I, I didn't enjoy going to them because they were in the retro trap. That trap is, it's boring. It might be the same format every single time. Uh, team members don't see a reason to go to it because they're not getting any benefit from that. It's not helping them in their job. It's not making them happier or making anything easier. There's no experiments coming out of it. It's just event session. Uh, people talk about what they don't like and then nothing changes. And then we'll do the same thing, same time in two weeks. Uh, or it keeps getting canceled, right? We have our retros at the end of our sprints or at the end of our iterations and because we have never figured out how much work we can actually do, we always overload our sprints. So we never have time to do the retros. So they always get canceled. And if, if all these points are true, why bother having a retro in the first place? If we're not getting value out of it, uh, why should we bother? So people started noticing this, this trap uh, and you started to see a lot of different formats come up for retrospectives. So maybe we're not just doing the three stickies anymore. Uh, maybe now we've got some cool shapes and some cool drawings, uh, but then it kind of exploded and now there's a thousand formats and it's very easy to get overloaded. And, and so I, I talk with scrum masters and they ask, I don't know what format to do. Why are there so many different formats? And the, the hint here, the big, the big secret is they're not there for the scrum master to stay relevant. This is not where the, the scrum master gets to justify their job by coming up with new crazier and crazier formats. They're there because when everything is on fire, it's easy to know what we need to talk about, right? When we're a new team and we're just forming, we know what our big problem areas are or what we're really succeeding at. And that's what we want to talk about. However, once things start to calm down, we probably have to dig a little bit deeper because it's easy to just walk in the room and say, well, 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 well everything's going pretty okay. There's nothing's really on fire. Um, everyone's enjoying, you know, life. We're getting stories done. That's cool. We need to be able to dig a little bit deeper to find those continuous improvement opportunities that aren't so obvious. So the formats, the idea behind the formats is to get beneath the team's surface thoughts and uncover the conversation that we actually need to have. We usually have to have a conversation to get to that right conversation. And that's what the formats are trying to facilitate. It's also why it's so important to give retrospectives enough space. Um, I guarantee you a half hour every month is not going to cut it. Teams need time to discover what they're going to talk about. However, how do you know which format to use? Uh, too often I see scrum masters or facilitators or, or coaches picking a random format. Uh, maybe they know the team, maybe they don't. And they just say, I'm going to do sales and anchors today. Why? Because that's not what we did last week. And I just want to keep switching it up. And that's, that's fine. Uh, that's, that's not bad. You should keep switching it up. However, when we talk about crafting retros, actually building something new that the team needs, I like to start with intent first. This is, this is how we go from good to great with our facilitation. I believe that if you start with the intent and let that intent drive what kind of format you're going to do, whatever games, whatever activities you're going to do, that will lead to a better discussion. So 
How do we do that? You can look through throughout the sprint, you're going to have observations, right? You're there as an unbiased observer of the team. You're going to be facilitating stuff, and, and we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, but you should be coming up with themes throughout the course of the sprint, and that will help you uh, know which intent to approach the next retro you're going to craft for the team. Uh, you have to know the team well enough to know what's going on. If, if you're trying to craft with intent, you have to know the team. Just showing up to a couple stand-ups every sprint or just looking at the board, you are not going to know the team well enough. And as we're talking about crafting, right, this means we're experimenting. We're not just telling our teams to experiment. We're going to experiment ourselves as well. You're going to get it wrong sometimes. As you're building your toolkit of how to be a great retro facilitator, you're going to get it wrong. Every facilitator has black and white flashbacks of when a retro went really off the rails maybe they weren't prepared maybe you forgot to uh, populate beforehand uh, you didn't get any data you forgot to set up the room or you weren't there right you were on vacation that's ha that happens that's part of it but that's part of the process too just like we're encouraging our teams to experiment and fail fast you're going to fail sometimes too it, it is scary but but we have to get past that in order to be able to craft good retros so what are the four intents? I, I believe that there are four main intents that retro formats can fall into. And what I believe an intent is, is as a facilitator, you need a strategy to guide the conversation. So an intent, think of it as a, a bucket for the different formats that you might want to pull from or know what to craft in order to get your desired outcome for the team. Oftentimes, as that unbiased observer, you're going to see a recurring theme or issue that you believe the team should focus on but they need to discover themselves, right? You can't always lead a horse to water. You can't just tell them, I think you're, I think our quality needs to get better. They need to discover that their quality is lacking. It means more when they discover it themselves. So having an intent in mind when you're designing your retrospectives gives guide rails to the, the games, the conversations, whatever you're doing to ensure that you start with that outcome in mind and still get there. Otherwise, you run the risk of burning an hour with random macaroni art activities when maybe everyone's having fun, but we might not be stumbling across those useful continuous improvement opportunities. So I've talked about them a lot. What are the four intents? Uh, quantitative, exploratory, specific, and teaming. We're going to step through each one of them. We're going to talk about how I like to approach with these intents in mind, and then go over an example of what one of those retros could look like as well. Uh, the very first one being quantitative. Uh, this is the scariest one because it's about data. And we tend to live our worlds. We, we, we exist and live in the world of feelings. Um, we have lots of things like, I feel like we could be going faster. I feel like our, our velocity isn't where it should be. Or I think we're overloading our sprint. The idea of a quantitative intent is to get away from those feeling statements and find some amount of data to be able to guide us. There's plenty of room for the, the feelings and assumptions, and we're going to talk about that with another intent. However, uh, I, I believe that it's very good to bring in data as often as we can to have something to compare the narrative to. Uh, so in order to do this, how are we going to do it? We're going to inspect the data. We're going to bring the data to the team and we're going to inspect it. And then we're going to question why it is the way that it is. Uh, and then we decide what we want the data to be instead. And that's what we'll base our experiments on. Something to remember about all metrics. There are a lot of scrum masters, a lot of coaches are scared of metrics because they can be used against teams. And also they can be easily gamed right? These are lagging indicators of the team's health, success, and performance. Each one just gives a tiny glimpse into the truth of where the team is actually at. So we have to treat them like they're the start of a conversation, not the, not the end-all be-all. They, they are there to help us build a narrative of what reality looks like. And they're only useful when they're accurate. All too often, it's it's very easy to have a directive saying we want our velocity to go up 10% every sprint. Every sprint, we should we should our velocity should be increasing because that's how we're improving, and that's based on a misunderstanding of what velocity is. So, in order to get anything out of this, we need to know what the metrics are and how they actually should be used for the team. So, what are you going to do as a facilitator? You're going to go out and you're going to start grabbing stuff that looks like this. Uh, whatever tool you're using. Uh, whether it's Jira, Azure DevOps, ServiceNow, pretty much everything has some amount of metrics built into it. 
at least for the agile stuff, at least for your sprint health, your your backlog, et cetera, uh, all of that tooling should already exist. And if it doesn't, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help you build it out. What uh, may be missing is going to be any type of technical uh, metrics that you want as well. So if you're looking at things like your your um, peer reviews, your commits, how often you're releasing, that stuff might be a little bit harder to get. So you're going to need to build that instrumentation. You and the team and whomever else might need to do it. Like I said, metrics are scary, right? This is my my credit card statement. I I don't like looking at my credit card statement every month. And that means I need to look at my credit card statement every month. This is the same thing with our metrics. It's real easy to just never look and hope and assume that everything's okay. But in the back of your mind, that that anxiety is building and the team feels it too. They're feeling that anxiety and they don't have a quantitative way to know whether they're succeeding. So you're going to go out and grab all of these different charts that you can, and you're going to put them in front of the team. This is an example of a mural uh, that we like to use here uh, where we can just pre-populate it before the retro even starts, get all the metrics that we wanna talk about uh, and then seed it with some questions as well. This is where you're gonna focus on the data with the team. You're gonna gather the metrics. You're going to explain the metrics to the team and say, this is your cumulative flow diagram. This is what it actually means. You're not gonna tell them why the chart looks the way that it does. You're just going to tell them what the chart is gathering, what data it's using, and then let them start questioning it. So explain what it's doing and then let them question why the numbers are whatever they are, whether they're good or they're bad. We don't want to make assumptions. Remember, it only tells a small part of the story. Uh, a lot of charts that I like to use for stuff like this, and most of them are right out of the tooling, would be things like your cumulative flow diagram, your cycle time, uh, rolling velocity, backlog health, right? Our, how big is our backlog? Do we have enough work in there? What's our ratio of stories to bugs to break fix to spikes, et cetera? Find, find out what your backlog looks like and if you're happy with how it's split up. Um, like I mentioned that the technical stuff, code check-ins, deployments, peer reviews, uh, that might be a little tougher to gather, but your team should definitely care about that. I, I know we don't know as scrum masters, coaches, we don't always live in that world as much, but we really, that, I mean, that's what we're actually building. We need to care about that stuff. So you go through this, you talk about it and the team questions it. You, you talk about, you know, why are there spikes in our control chart? Why are there dips in our burn down? Is it meeting reality? Are we slicing stories the right size so that we're able to continue closing them throughout the course of the sprint? And then you identify one or two metrics that you want to improve. And hopefully it's something that the team cares about too. And if, if they don't care about it, you probably haven't done a good job explaining why it is important to them yet. So maybe it's cycle time. Maybe your cycle time is eight days right now. Maybe it's nine days, maybe it's 35 days, right? Just how do we get that down to what is a better cycle time? Uh, and then the team says, oh, coach, what is a good cycle time? And I'll, I'd say, yeah, you know, three or four days. I think that'd be great if if all of our stories can get closed within that time span. I, I think that we'd be pretty predictable and, and we could make really meaningful commitments. Then you design the experiments in order to do that. One other really cool thing that you can do with quantitative retros is you can actually apply this quantitative mindset to the qualitative feelings and experiences that that people tend to uh, experience throughout the course of the sprint. The problem is you're trying to measure data based on feelings and people's feelings change every day. That's just people have feelings, they change. I don't know why, but that's what people do. Uh, so you need to be measuring it often. Uh, we built a tool here at Sketch called Waypointer, uh, and that's what we use to perform squad health checks and capabilities assessments. And I like doing them at least quarterly, if not more often with teams, just to check in and see how things are going. Are we moving the needle in a positive direction or is something getting worse, right? If we find out that we're really focusing on easing our, our, our ability to release, maybe we're dropping uh, our quality. Maybe we want to check back in on that. So this is a great tool uh, to use with your team. You have to build up the data over time. Uh, and just like before, if you want to pick one of these to focus on and try to improve it. Maybe we wanna improve our, our speed or our teamwork. The, having a tool like this will let you keep from ignoring everything else. You won't get tunnel visioned uh, as much. 
All right, that's a lot about quantitative. Uh, let's move on to exploratory. This is the, the majority of retros today, whether people realize it or not. It's, hey, we're going to come up with a bunch of things we could talk about. We're going to get past those surface thoughts and feelings. Uh, and then we're going to figure out what we need to talk about. This is great for established teams or where there is is not something that we obviously need to, to get on, that, that we need to figure out and we need to get better at. Uh, they also take a strong facilitator because you have to come into the room with the outcome that you'd like to get to. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I know we need to figure out why we have so many bugs. How do I get the team to care about it? And you can use an exploratory retro to help them discover the consequences of all of the bugs that they have. But you need to be able to keep the conversation on track while simultaneously knowing something bigger has come up. We need to shift focus to that. It, it's okay. A lot of retros do not go the way that we expect them to. And that's where exploratory uh, really comes in handy. But a good facilitator will know when you hit the right topic and you say, hey, this sounds like something we should dig into further. And here's a pro tip, be patient. It might take 50 out of 60 minutes to get to the right conversation. I, I can't tell you how many retros I've been in where we're all looking at the clock because it's almost over. And then suddenly we stumble on the things like, oh, this is what we need to talk about. Uh, so I, I would seriously encourage you to, to have a, a long enough time box to make sure uh, that, that you don't run out of time right as the conversation is getting good. So how do we, how do we have exploratory retros? They, they all tend to follow a similar path uh, we, we don't want to just group stickies and leave. We want to gather insights from the team first. Maybe you give them a starter topic or question. Maybe you let them just go hog wild and talk about whatever they want to talk about. But as we start to get these insights from the teams, you're going to expound on them. You're going to ask open-ended questions and elaborate on them to discover what themes are kind of going on under the surface. With something like this, you don't want to forget the quiet people in the room, and most teams tend to have at least a couple more introverted people on there. They often have perspectives that no one else on the team has considered, but you also need to know your people, right? Are, are they quiet because that's their nature and you just got to pull it out of them a little bit, or are they quiet because they don't feel safe? Maybe there's a lack of psychological safety. You don't want to damage your psych safety just to beat the answer out of somebody. If, if they really are set on being quiet, they're going to be quiet. Uh, but you're going to push the team members who did give answers to expound on them and ask other team members how they think uh, that thing is or how they feel about it. Uh, you're going to ask dumb questions. I'm, this is something I excel at is asking really, really dumb questions. Uh, and just, you know, things like explain it like I'm five. Help me understand this. I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm not that technical. Uh, can you put this in different words? Uh, you can also do Socratic questioning. That, that can be very uh, powerful as well. Um, so how would this release, how would you rather this release have looked or how could it have gone better versus here's how I think this release should have gone because now you're just kind of forcing your own opinion down other people's throats and not letting them uh, really run the meeting. Uh, pro tip for this one, if you're talking the most, like I'm doing right now, if you're talking the most, you're doing it wrong. This is where the team needs to have the conversation. Exploratory retros are also great for guest facilitators uh, where uh, you don't know the team and you don't have the blinders on that someone who's with the team all the time might. The longer we're with teams, the more uh, premises we tend to accept and, and we say this is the way that it is because it's always been that way and it'll never change. A guest facilitator coming in blind might ask one of those dumb questions that no one else would. Uh, and sometimes you'd be surprised at what the answers to that are. So what could exploratory look like? Uh, this is a real simple one that you, you'd be amazed uh, how many fantastic conversations come out of exploratory retros. Uh, house of straw, house of sticks, and, and house of bricks. This, right, this is similar to the, the three questions that we're all used to with retros, uh, where it's what's going well, what's going poorly, what do we need to improve, or what do we need to do differently? But it's just kind of flipping it on a different angle. So you're going to take it, you're going to let the team populate all three of these, and you're going to discover what are the things that we're really scared about? Uh, what are the things that we know are not scalable versus the things that they're probably sustainable, but we might want to work at them at some point. And then it, it's also a chance to, to celebrate your success. What are, what are the things that we're doing really well? What are the things that we're building uh, in a sturdy manner that we don't have to keep worrying about? That's just an example of what one exploratory retro could look like. Uh, next up, we're halfway through. Uh, specific. 
Uh, specific retros are really great for when there's a topic that the team or the coach or somebody else wants to cover, right? We want to deep dive into something. These are themes that you could be capturing throughout the course of a sprint. Uh, like I mentioned, you're the unbiased observer. You're going to see patterns that the team members aren't aware of, but maybe there is something that they are aware of too. Uh, maybe it's a big effort, a big project, a big release, who knows what, but we want to really dive in and, and pick this one apart and, and figure out why we would want to do this. Uh, and just looking at the, the background of this slide makes me think a perfect example of a specific retro, get your whole team together and try to figure out why anyone ever thought the Big Bang Theory was funny. You might need three or four hours to, to pick through that one, though. So how do we do specific retros? We're going to set the stage. Uh, the five whys we'll, we'll talk about in a second as an example of it. But in any format for these, you want to set the stage and make sure we know what we're here to talk about, what the timeline is, is it big or small? We're going to uh, question and question and question and dig deeper and dig deeper. Uh, and it can look something like this. Uh, if anyone's seen this before, we like to call this the, the fishbone. Uh, and I like to use this with the five whys. This is a great uh, way to start with a significant problem statement where there's something that we really need to work on. This is a recurring problem that's not going anywhere. It's not getting better on its own. Or we had a big failure, or even we had a big success. Maybe you had an engagement that went really well, or a project that went really well, and you want to be able to duplicate that success. We want to, to really be able to step back and figure out what happened to make it that success, or when it didn't go well, what happened to make it more of a failure. So like I mentioned, you want to set the stage. The, the bigger the scope, the harder it's going to be. So are you confining the retro to a span of time? Because uh, if it's the last year, that's going to be a lot tougher to get anything out of versus the last sprint or the last quarter or the last PI. Uh, is it is it scope based or is it milestone based? Did we have a big release or an outage? Did we did somebody break prod? Right? Are we celebrating a win or trying to understand a failure? So first, you want to establish the safety. We're here to learn. We're not here to finger point. Uh, and make sure that you have the right people there. If you're if you're talking about a big project, you might have worked with other other teams on it. So, do you need some of those teams in attendance? Is this going to be a different retro than normal, where maybe we need to get some other attendees that don't normally show up? Root cause analysis uh, through something like the Five Whys is excellent for this. Uh, you can also do journey maps. Uh, and those work on epics, features, releases. I'm actually going to show a, a personal journey map here in a little while. But as you're going through this, you're going to want to keep building momentum and keep attacking that problem statement from different directions, right? The, the example that we have on, on the mural board there that no one could possibly read uh, is why aren't we know the problem is people aren't showing up to our retros. And then you just keep asking why. And then you come up with a reason and then you ask why that reason is so why aren't people showing up to our retros? Well, because we don't have enough time. Why don't we have enough time? Because there's too much work in the sprint. Why is there too much work in the sprint? Because we've never figured out what our velocity is. Why have we never figured that out? Because no one goes to retros, right? It, it, it might be circular, but eventually you start getting down to that root problem uh, that that is what the team actually needs to create experiments and action items on uh, in order to make that problem better. So that's specific. Uh, fourth and final, and probably my favorite, uh, are going to be teaming retros, right? This is where we move from that group of individuals into an actual team of, of shared purpose, shared commitment, shared success, shared failure, et cetera. So this is a social meeting, and you can set it up like so. Take take these ones and go somewhere else. Uh, if you're in person, don't, don't go in the office if you can help it. Go to a park, go to a bar, go sit under a tree outside. Uh, if it's virtual, make it fun. Uh, try to, to have it in a different setting than you normally do. And we're gonna take the focus off of work for a little while, at least the, the work that we just did. Uh, and we're gonna figure out how to work together better as a team. This is something that we're inherently doing all the time, but it's really good to approach it uh, consciously as well and say, we're going to dedicate this next one to improving ourselves as a team. So maybe stay away from trust falls. Um, hopefully we can get a, a little better than that in this day and age. Um, but it's also a great way to move and, and work through conflict, assuming the team has enough psychological safety. If there's uh, something that the team is still having friction points around, or if you've moved from 
uh, forming into storming and you're like, hey, I, I think we're storming right now. We should probably, this is a good time to figure out where this, uh, where this frustration is coming from. Uh, and you can use them to focus on things like your team charter, right? All your different working agreements. Uh, do we have a vision for our product or for our team? Do we have a mission? Do we know why we're here? Uh, and then if you do have these, these friction points on the team, I really like using these uh, artifacts, your definition of ready, your definition of done, or your working agreements to figure out how we as a team can agree to, uh, to, to resolve those problems. So maybe <clears throat> someone on the team isn't showing up to stand-ups on time. They show up every day late, or they show up and they say, I don't know, I just got here. I haven't had time to look at my uh, outlook yet, and I don't know what I'm doing today. This is a great time to use the working agreements to where you can fix that problem without attacking the person. So you can say, hey, what's what's not working about our standups? What's not working? Is it the time? Do we need to change the time? What would it take to, to make sure that we could all be there? And then you can set a working agreement and say, great, everyone agrees we're going to show up to, to stand up on time with an idea of what we're doing today already. This is, I, I use this example because it happens frequently where uh, it turns out a friction point is that the person doesn't have time to drop off their kids and then get back to their computer in, in with enough time to, to make a plan for the day. So great, use this as a safe way to work through that problem. And someone just says, hey, could it be 15 minutes later? Wonderful. Uh, journey maps are also a, a great thing to do here. 360 feedback where we uh, give each other uh, uh, any type of feedback we need on things that as individuals, as teammates, we're doing well or, or, or we need to improve on. Uh, and then those squad health checks that I mentioned earlier, this is a great time to knock one of those out. Just, hey, it's been a while since we've stepped back and, and looked at uh, our release speed or, or any of those other factors. Maybe we jump into that. A really cool one uh, that I heavily enjoy uh, is a personal journey map. Uh, this is an example of one uh, that we did in Mural uh, two weeks ago, last week, with, with my coaching team here from uh, Sketch. And I'll tell you, it is just, uh, this, this is mine. Uh, it is fascinating how every time I do this with a team, I mean, I've, I've worked with these coaches for uh, over two years now for, for some of them and working side by side every day. And just by going through, hey, here's how I got to where I am right now, you learn so much about each other that you have never uncovered in years of working every day side by side on the same project. Is oh, you went to that college, I went to that college. We had no idea. Now we have another connection point. Or uh, if people feel safe and they can talk about, you know, uh, difficult things that they've that they've had to to suffer through in life and uh, how they learned or or grew from those things or or how they held them back. Uh, it turns into a really powerful conversation. So I, I highly recommend doing these, uh, scope them to whatever setting people feel comfortable. Maybe you don't start as when I was a young boy in the hills of Pennsylvania, uh, maybe you started as, okay, I graduated high school and now I'm going to talk about my career from then uh, to now. But it, it really is a, a fantastic thing to, uh, to do with the team. Okay, so those are the four intents. Now, what happens when you've had a great retro? We have learned about each other. We have uncovered opportunities for greatness. We've lived, we've laughed, we've loved. But what happens when there's something that the team can't fix, right? And I'm, I'm gonna caveat this, that there, this actually is something that the team can't fix. This isn't a thing that the team doesn't wanna fix. But there are things that get uncovered or are known throughout retros that are outside of the team's ability to, to uh, do anything about. They're out of your scope of influence. This is the Scrum Master's time to shine. This is where you 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 win the team's love, loyalty, respect, other words from the speech in a high school football movie, and you truly get to add immense value as the team's servant. Um, this is where you might need to go work with other teams, product owners, managers, VPs. It doesn't matter. You're, you're going to say, okay, team, we agree this is out of our scope of control, but something needs to be done about it. I'm going to take this and run with it. And I'm going to pull in people as needed, but you get to keep focusing on your day to day. We're going to roll into next sprint. We're not going to solve this overnight, but I'm going to keep moving this ball forward. This, this is one of the, the three key things that I believe a scrum master should be doing. And it, I believe it can add much more value than just opening up calls and, and 
taking attendance or, or moving cards across the board for people. You may have to try to quantify uh, the effects of a problem a dozen times until you find a way that the right chord resonates with the right number of people and affects that change. Oftentimes, however, there are changes where it may be outside of your scope of control as well, right? Evolutionary changes for a team are those continuous improvement activities that the team or the team with people nearby in the team are able to, to affect change on their own. But when it's outside of the team's control, it's outside of your control, uh, we're not really talking about continuous improvement anymore. Now, now the revolution has begun, right? This is, uh, this is going to take a much greater effort than any one person has influence to do. Now it's your job to escalate these things. This doesn't just mean sending emails. Uh, oftentimes these things require organizational change, maybe structural, maybe cultural, probably both. Uh, this is what coaches are really good for. Coaches typically have a broader scope, oftentimes higher influence and a whole additional network of pitchforks. Uh, they need you bringing these problems to them, however, uh, or these opportunities so that they can address them in whatever backlog or transformational roadmap that they're working on. Uh, coaches also frequently benefit from a different reporting structure than scrum masters, uh, which gives them the safety to rally that change on a larger scale. Um, if you're struggling with, with influence and, and you recognize revolutionary changes, but you're not able to get anything done about them, uh, let us know. We're happy to help. So how do you take everything that I've given you so far, and how do you actually put it into practice? Well, the way to do it is to start planning for the retro on day one of the sprint. All right. Every single interaction you have with a team is an opportunity for you to influence and craft an even better retro. So it starts in sprint planning. Right, we are sitting there with the team in sprint planning. Scrum masters, I I like to sit back, and it's just a conversation between the team and the product owner. I get to get kick my feet up and not have to run the meeting or even necessarily facilitate it. So now I get to observe. I get to watch. Is the backlog in a healthy state? Are we aware of our rolling velocity, and are we honoring in it, or are we setting ourselves up for ridiculous commitments that we know there's no possible way we're going to do it? I, I, I see this all the time where a team has never completed more than 40 story points, and then they go into sprint planning and they commit to 100 story points. Why, why are we doing that, right? This is maybe you can't address it in the moment, but you're going to make a note that this is something that we need to talk about in the retro. Now we're going to go into the daily standups. And I'm, I'm just assuming that the majority of people are doing scrum. So this is however your ceremonies change. Um, you can still be looking for these opportunities in the daily standup. Are you running the meeting or is it the team's meeting? Are they talking to each other or are they talking to you? Are they giving status to you or are they looking for collaboration opportunities? And are we moving stories across the board as quickly as we start by, by day or three, day three, day four? you're probably going to start to see the themes appearing for uh, what we need to talk about in the next retro. If it's day five in the 10-day sprint and we haven't closed any stories yet, that's probably worth pulling up that burn down chart and showing it to the team and, and walking them through what that means and why we should be closing stories. Backlog refinement. Are we looking deep enough in our backlog? Are we having the conversations that we need to in order to meet our definition of ready and set our team ourselves up for success and where we're making meaningful commitments? Or are we blowing past it and no, we're skipping it because who really wants to spend time in refinement? I don't, I get it, but it's how we have really easy and pain-free sprint planning sessions. Now we're getting towards the end of the sprint, uh, the sprint review and the demo. Is the whole team demoing? Do we actually have things to demo or are we just uh, kind of hoping that uh, we'll show some PowerPoint slides and we'll, we can pretend that that's a demo, even though we have nothing to, to show for the last sprint? I, I don't care what kind of team you're working on, whether it's uh, software development, mobile infrastructure your teams are working on valuable things. It's up to you to figure out how to articulate that value in a way that you can get feedback on it. And that's going to be you encouraging the product owner, encouraging the team to slice work small enough to where you actually can get real feedback. The, the entire purpose of Scrum is feedback loops. And so if we're not getting any at the, the sprint review and the demo, because we don't have anything to show for it, we're, we're really missing out on a big opportunity there. So now by day 10, you should have a very clear in, idea in mind of what the outcome of the retrospective should be. 
And now you can approach it with the proper intent that you believe will accomplish that outcome. There's going to be times all throughout the sprint where you want to open your mouth and say something and call out a problem, but it's not always the right time. In fact, it's not your job to even fix everything. It is the scrum master's job to pick up the carpet and point at the crap under it and say, hey, all of this stuff is here. When are you going to do something about it? What are we going to do to make this better? And if the team doesn't want to do it, okay, okay I'm going to put the carpet down, but in two weeks, I'm going to pick it back up. I'm going to say, hey, all that crap is still there. What are we going to do about it? Uh, it's your job to, to pick up the carpet, not to clean out from under it. As you start to uh, build your ability to, to craft retros, you're going to start mixing and matching. Uh, this is a great example. I, I, I love this, uh, the 90s called themed retro, uh, where you can see there's a little bit of everything. We start with some teaming where we just talk about nostalgia and favorite shows. Then we talk about uh, what went well and what didn't go well. We can pull in metrics. So we've got some quantitative and you're able to pick and choose where we need to spend more time or where we should move on from. There's a little bit of all four intents in every four. If you think about it long enough, you will see bits and pieces of all four intents in every single format. That's okay have a primary intent. And as you grow in your ability to craft and master retros, you will know which area to spend more time on. Don't lose track. Uh, I, can't, I can't say this enough. Your team is going to get lost in the weeds. They are going to be focusing on the stories they're working on. It's up to you to keep track of potential improvement opportunities that we should talk about, but we haven't yet. Whatever ongoing experiments that are coming out of our existing retros. So if you've got two experiments and it's day five or day six of the sprint, you don't need to nag people, but remind them like, hey, Matt, uh, you, you said you were going to be running with this uh, experiment. How's that going? And then Matt says, oh, I haven't thought about that at all yet. I should totally get on that. And then you say, yeah, you totally should because there's four days left in the sprint. Uh, and then keep track of the, the completed ones. See what worked well and what didn't. Um, because you, you want to be able to share this with other teams. Uh, you want to be able to look at it yourselves as a team and, and show how far you've come. Uh, the more experiments, the, the, the better. If you, if you have, let's say, three experiments per sprint over the course of a year, that's 70, 78, 80 experiments. Uh, even if half of them achieve the intended outcome, imagine how, how much better the team's life will be. So keep track of that stuff. Keep track of the wins. And then how do you know your retros are working? Uh, well, the most obvious is team members say our retros are working. We love going to retros. You're an amazing facilitator. Um, I love you. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes people are a little more reserved than that. That's okay. Uh, but you're going to be able to tell. You're going to see improved morale. There ought to be more collaboration. Those metrics that we're scared to look at, they should start getting less and less scary to look at. Um, we'll, we'll see improvement and, and it's important to define what that improvement is, uh, velocity going up every sprint, probably not real improvement, uh, cycle time, getting consistent velocity, getting consistent. Those are the things that we care about. And people are excited to go to the retro. Um, they're really excited. They can't wait for it. And they actually might even have a little bit of suspense in it. So we've talked about a lot. What next? First things first, reset with your teams. Hey, you get it. You're here. You cared enough to be here. Maybe you've already thought all the thoughts that I've ever had about retros. You get it. It's very likely that some of your team doesn't get it yet. We need to sell people on the idea that retros can be worth their time and engagement before we see max benefit from them. So I'm happy to come and give this talk to anyone that you think could benefit from it or could learn from it. Uh, at your organization. Uh, you can also see all of our past webinars online, um, but you want to reset with the team and then start approaching them with intent. Think to yourself, what am I trying to get out of this next retro? You're going to have to put a little bit of forethought into it. And then you have no need to, to have the same retro uh, within six months, probably you could, you could keep switching it up and keep it engaging and keep it uh, being suspenseful for the team. Never have the same retro two weeks in a row. So coming out of here, uh, you should follow Sketch Development on LinkedIn because we're going to have a follow on to this webinar as part of our Raise the Bar series, uh, where myself and a few other coaches have some drinks, uh, and we're going to debate retros, maybe get crazy and talk about politics or religion or something else. But we're also going to answer all the questions from today that we haven't, uh, that, that we don't get a chance to talk through if we have any extras. Um, also, we have our coaches top 10 favorite retros. 
uh, built as templates in Mural, complete with facilitation instructions. Uh, and they work for both virtual and in-person teams. You've gotten to see uh, five of them uh, just in this presentation. Uh, hit me up. Uh, they can work on Mural, Miro, uh, in-person, uh, any other tool that you want. Just shoot me a note. Uh, my, my email is there and it's on this invite as well. Also, also, like I mentioned, you can view this and all of our past webinars uh, at sketchdev.io. And also, 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 we have another webinar coming up uh, next quarter. Uh, and I hear it's going to dive into the fact that until you have delivered something, you're only spending money. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for the time and the attention for this. Uh, we are going to jump into some uh, questions here. And uh, if you need the URL, it's there again at Slido right there. All right. So we got a whole bunch. Uh, first and foremost, do we get a copy of this deck? Uh, yes, you can have the, the PowerPoint deck and you can also have a recording of the webinar. Like I mentioned, this and all of our past webinars uh, are at sketchdev.io. Um, specific recommendations for 100% remote and geographically dispersed teams. I'll tell you, since I, I, I was really bad at this, uh, up until the, the pandemic hit, I just, I hated having retros where we weren't in the room because uh, I just felt like we were missing out on so much. However, the pandemic kind of forced everyone to, to get better at that. I think using virtual whiteboard tools like Mural or like Miro, I mean, I have lived and breathed on Mural for the last two and a half years, and I, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. They work really great for <clears throat> not only 100% virtual teams, but also for hybrid teams where some people are in the room and some people are virtual. That's always a that's always a tough situation to be in because it it tends to be that the people on on the the phone get left out of the conversation and and that sucks. We don't want to do that. So having something that hey everyone in the room you open your laptops too and I'm not even going to present on the TV. We're all going to be in the mural or on the whiteboard, whatever you're using. Uh, and we're all going to look at it together. That way, everyone has the exact same level of participation. I think tools like that are crucial. I really do think it is also worthwhile to try to uh, get whatever money and bang on however many doors you need to in order to get everyone in the same room. I don't know whether you can do that once a year, once a quarter, however often it's realistic. It is, it is so powerful to have a, a team of people who only ever see from here to hear on a, on a webcam, to actually be in person, have lunch together, talk about stuff that's not related to work whatsoever. It's huge. So I, I, I can't recommend it enough. I know it's very difficult. Um, do whatever it takes to get your people in the room. As a coach, as a facilitator, as a scrum master, that should be something that, that I believe you should try to make happen. Uh, those exploratory formats are also really good for that um, because they, they give a chance for everyone to have a voice. And, and it's okay, especially with like uh, teaming retros to just make them fun. Don't make them about anything uh, work related. Just it, you, you're giving, you're given this hour for the team uh, to step away from work, actually step away from work. Talk about stuff like personal journeys, talk about your favorite TV shows, just something to, to keep norming and, and performing as, as a team getting closer together. Cause once we see each other as human beings with real lives, um, being able to know, you know, I, I, I'm, I keep showing up late because my kid, uh, this is very relevant to me, my, my kid won't sleep. And uh, so I'm late every day because of that. Uh, once the team understands that, they're not going to hold it against me. But if we don't talk about what's going on at home too, we're, we're never going to know that. And, and there's an opportunity for resentment there. Uh, do you have any tips for teams that are really introverted? Let me think about this one. I think I would start by taking it completely away from work and picking something that has the opportunity for everyone to share. So I would probably start with, um, I'll, I'll push on everyone a little bit to where they need one answer, but what's a hobby? Or where's your favorite place that you've traveled? Or, or just something personal um, that so everyone has something that they're excited about. Some people, they love hanging out with their kids. Some people, they love not hanging out with their kids and playing video games instead. Uh, whatever it is, find a question that everyone on the team can answer. I, I worked with a scrum master uh, one time and, and she did this really great trick where she would just have people send in pictures ahead of the time uh, in order to 
uh, to, to give people a chance to say, where, where did you travel? And then she would just show those pictures and then people would have the opportunity to talk about it. Um, John, what do you think? Yeah, can I take a, uh, an opportunity to answer the introvert question? Because uh, as an ambivert, it's uh, <laughs> uh, sort of important to me. Two things to, to keep in mind, <clears throat> introverts would prefer to write their responses than to say their responses. So as James mentioned in the past, Mural is a really good, or Miro or any digital collaborative uh, tool uh, is really helpful for uh, introverted team members to get to participate without having to shine a spotlight on them. Uh, number two, introverts don't really like to be surprised. Uh, they like to be prepared. So <clears throat> to the extent that you can not surprise them with the format of your retrospective on the day of, that you can let them know this is what they're going to do, um, then that'll give them a chance for their brains to start preparing for that event. And <clears throat> the uh, I think the contribution will will raise as a result. Awesome. All right. Uh, next one, a similar vein. How how do you celebrate a win with remote teams? Um, I I think it's just as crucial uh, with remote teams, if not even more so, to do this because if you work from home all the time, your job never really ends. You never really get out of the office, so you need something to break up the monotony of logging onto your computer and then logging off, but you're still in your home office all the time. So I really like setting up, even if it's got to be after hours, uh, or if you can get an excuse to do it during the day, have a virtual happy hour. I mean, and, and people drink whatever they want. If it's in the morning, we'll have a coffee happy hour. And if it's in the afternoon, all bets are off. People drink whatever they want. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've sent care packages before I've gotten a little bit of budget and sent everyone a little care package, uh, during the pandemic, uh, sketched it a, a holiday happy hour where everyone got little, uh, different ingredients for holiday, uh, themed cocktails. Uh, and we all made them, uh, on camera and experimented with them and talked about how bad they tasted because they each called for a stick of butter and that was really gross. Um, but you, you still need to do that. It, it can't just be, uh, we log on, we do our work, we log off. You, you have to take extra steps to celebrate those wins. I, I could not agree with that more. Speaking of metrics, do you feel that these are appropriate for measuring an individual's performance goals? No, I, I do not. I don't think that any agile metric that I've ever seen does a good job of giving me a glimpse into reality of whether an individual is performing well or not. I think there are other tools that you can, but any type of team metrics, they're about the team. They're not about the individual. And I, I saw this bite someone uh, in the rear one time where they, <clears throat> a, a leader away from the team was starting to pull uh, all the pull requests and figuring out who was, who was committing more code essentially. And uh, uh, boil down, you were rewarded for the more, the more code you wrote. And, uh, and he, he came to me and said, why isn't so-and-so ever, uh, committing anything. They're not doing any polls. They're, they're not committing anything. Why is that? And I said, well, it's that's because they're the team lead and they're sitting next to people as they're coding um, and helping them do better, uh, which is their job. Uh, so as soon as you start to look at who's moving stories across the board uh, more or who's closing stories, uh, you're, you're, you've already lost the, the forest for the trees there and you're going to get inaccurate conclusions from that. Um, so no, I, I do not think that those metrics are appropriate for it. They That will scare people and that will damage your psychological safety. And there is just a whole lot of bad uh, it, it, that goes along with that. How do you keep, uh, I'll, and I'll rephrase that, by working with the team, you're going to be aware of the individual's performance. It will become obvious who is contributing and who is not contributing. If you have no idea, it's because you're too far away from the team. How do you keep a retro from being overwhelmed with all the tasks that need to be reviewed? Um, treat retros like a marathon. They, they are not a sprint. And if it's a longstanding team, meaning you're more than a tiger team, that's going to be together for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're, we're going to treat this with the scientific method. We're only going to tweak a few variables and we're going to keep as much stuff controlled as we can, because if we change everything, we have no, we're just going to muddy the water and we have no idea what's getting better or what's getting worse. Um, so I, I would not try to get all of the things done in every single retro you're going to it's just like uh, pulling from a backlog you're going to have to prioritize based on what's the highest value what do you want to talk about the most and what does the team want to talk about the most hopefully that's the same thing it's not always and so uh, you're going to have to have trade-offs there of, of 
if the team's really passionate about something, use that passion and let them focus on it. And if uh, you're really passionate about something, hopefully you've got some amount of grace going with the team uh, where they will uh, allow you to, to kind of put your finger on the scale with that one. What would you do different in a retro when the discussion involves non-digital solutions? Um, so I'm going I'm to assume that this is uh, talking about nothing to do with software. Maybe there's not even computers involved. You still ought to have a retro and it still ought to have a very similar format. Um, maybe not the quantitative one, but everything else is just, we're a team trying to accomplish a goal. How are we going to get better as a team at accomplishing that goal? It's just as valuable. Well, I mean, uh, military teams do retrospectives. They just call them other things. Uh, hospital staff, uh, doctors and, and nurses do retrospectives together. They also have little standups um, because it's so valuable. If you're a team of people working towards a shared goal, take some time off, get together and figure out how are we doing at accomplishing our goals and what are we going to try to do better? Uh, and, and how are we going to accomplish those goals stronger, better, faster? How long should our team retros take each sprint? I would say just shooting from the hip, uh, Mike, that this would be at least an hour if you're, if you're doing a two week sprint, I, I think that's a pretty safe time box. Um, cause the alternative would be a half hour. Uh, it just going off of how most people use Outlook. And I guarantee that's just not enough time to really get into any uh, real heady conversation. You're just going to hit the highlights and then run out of the room. Probably doesn't need to be two hours. Uh, that's probably more than enough. But if you're doing something like the, the personal journey maps, uh, maybe it's because I did it with a team of coaches. Uh, and even though there was four or five of us, it took us two and a half hours um, because coaches like to talk, right? We just all like to talk and we like to question uh, and it is what it is. Um, but depending on what you're going to be trying to accomplish with that retro, I would say at least an hour if your sprints are two weeks. If you're uh, being crazy and going for four or six weeks sprints, I'm th I think the retro is going to need to be a lot longer uh, or try to have it maybe multiple retros per sprint. <clears throat> we have teams spread across the globe. Those in the U.S. are vocal and those elsewhere remain silent. How do you help get all team members to speak up? Uh, like John was mentioning earlier, I think this is a great opportunity to uh, let people know what's coming and you can even seed the, the retro beforehand. Like, hey, here's the questions that we're going to go over. I'm going to let you know three days ahead of time. That's three days where you can prepare your answers to those questions. And if they're written, uh, no one has a louder voice than anyone else. Uh, you, you, you've got to try to make everyone equal in the room. And so uh, I've done this before with teams where I've got local uh, co-located U.S. team members and then virtual uh, non-U.S. team members. I will send the U.S. team members home so that everyone is on the phone all at once uh, because that's the only way that it's equal. If not, no one can hear the side conversations happening in the room off of the phone on the desk so they just kind of get abandoned and checked out and go do other things with their time while the room has a cool conversation, but you're missing half of the voices. So find a way to make all the voices equal. That would be the, the, the biggest thing I can think of there. Uh, where on the website do the webinars live? They live at, uh, under the resources tab, library, and in there on sketchdev.io. Uh, what is the risk in having a manager in the retro? This is a great question. Uh, psychological safety. I, I assume, and I am almost never wrong with that assumption, that there is a difference in the tone of the conversation when the person who is responsible for people's promotions and raises is in the room versus when they're not in the room. If Chris and I work for the same person, and even, even if we're on good terms, uh, if we're having some friction, if we bumped heads or something on a technical solution in the last sprint, if our boss is in the room, am I going to throw Chris on, am I going to run the risk of throwing Chris under the bus by saying, Hey man, that, that didn't go well. That, that kind of sucked, right? What, what are we going to do about that? I don't want to make Chris look bad in front of their boss or assuming negative intent, my favorite assumption, uh, I am going to throw Chris under the bus because his boss is in the room and that's also not good. Just, I don't care if you do have the best boss ever and, and people love them, uh, there still is a difference in tone. Uh, 
I'm okay with managers being invited into the retros, um, but they're like vampires. They have to be invited in. The team has to be okay with it. The scrum has, the scrum master has to be okay with it uh, because it is just so damaging to giving the team the space to have an actual team led conversation. Uh, let's see, probably one or two more. Uh, how can you do a quantitative retro if your team is continuously changing team members? You probably can't. I think that's going to be the question is how do we stop changing our team members so much? And this might be something that's kind of an external impediment to the team, where if you've got contractors rolling on or off constantly, or if you're on tiger teams, you're probably not really a team yet. And, and there's no way to break out of that forming stage to get past anything. Teams need to stay together long enough to start having some consistency. Otherwise, your, your velocity is useless if you've got four team members one sprint and 12 team members the next sprint. Uh, I, I'd love to understand more of the uh, reasons behind that question. Uh, if, if you want to talk about that more, feel free to, to shoot me an email because uh, there's a lot of nuance there. And from Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Uh, if you start to notice conflicting goals either within the team or between the team and their leadership, how do you recommend closing those gaps? Inside a retrospective, uh, we really only ever talk about the team's goals. And the Scrum Master can be a bridge between the team and others and bring those others into there. Uh, but the retro probably isn't the right place to work through that. Um, and unfortunately, I think we're out of time for the rest of the questions. Uh, but like I mentioned, we are going to do the follow on, raise the bar. We can talk about the, re the rest of them there. Um, Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much for the time today. I, I hope and pray that this was useful to you. And if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, have a great day, uh, almost weekend. Uh, thank you very much.